interpretation of, of what the Bible is instead of getting into what God's word says it is. So I'm gonna, we're going to pray. We're going to start in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Father, thank you for this day that you've made. We rejoice and we're glad in it. We're glad because you have poured out into our lives the greatest gift we could ever hope to receive, and that is you. You've given us you. And, and the more we press into you, the more we receive of you, and the more we receive of you, the more we become like you, and the more we become like you, the more we can be the salt and light that you've called us to be. Lord, the world is the world is a dark place. The world mindset is a dark place, but you've called us to something higher. Being and bearing much fruit. Lord, we're your fruit, but we get to bear much fruit, and we can only do that as we empty ourselves of us and become more like you. Help us to do that in Jesus' name. All right. You should be able to see. They, they can see it on the other one. I've got it fixed. I've got it recording two different ways. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now, I, as I was getting ready for this this week, the Lord gave me this next, next line. He said, you know, how many of those war movies you've watched where you've heard the captain say damage control report, you know, and, and what happens when we get saved? Uh, and by the way, damage control is a responsibility in this. It's like a, a, a ship responsibility. So that the ship gets torpedoed or bombed, the captain's going to call damage control and find out what the heck just happened. How bad is this? All right. So <clears throat> when you got born again, the devil got torpedoed. When you made that sincere profession of faith, the devil got torpedoed he tried everything he could to stop it and the instant that he saw you were the lord's his next phrase was damage control report all right now i want you to look at this we're in, now we're going to go to john chapter 10 and we're going to kind of pull this to pieces a little bit i am the door jesus is the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now, <clears throat> I want you to understand, we, we can take apart those words, and you can do that if you want to go back and look at it. Destruction, where it says destroy, that means separated forever from God. Okay, that's the second death. That's what that's referring to. That destroy, that's what that's about. All right. The other stuff, we just took that away. When you got born again, you took that away from the devil. When you received Jesus Christ as your Savior, when, when you repented and accepted Christ, the devil got torpedoed. All right, he can't destroy you, but he can steal and he can, and he can kill. Well, how do I know that? Did you ever read the book of Job? I, studied, I, was, I was in the study of the book of Job the whole last month. All right, we need, we need to understand he will steal and he will kill if he can't destroy. Now, this picture was one of the coolest ones I've ever taken around here. This is before they had the, the electric poles along the road there. But can you? I, I didn't see it until somebody pointed out to me, but there's this hand coming down out of the clouds and it's got this, it's full of blessings. Okay, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, I dug into 1 Corinthians 2 to get a little bit, and you'll hear a lot less opinion and a lot more word when I'm preaching and teaching. I don't really, um, my opinions are sometimes they have weight, sometimes they don't, but this is from the Word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in the ninth verse, for as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the good things which God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man, which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. All right, he told us he has plans 
for us. He's prepared good things for us to do in advance. There's another scripture. I can't remember the location right now, but he prepared good works for us to do in advance. God has a plan and a strategy. Why does God have a plan and a strategy? Because he has an objective. What's God's objective? God is not willing that any would perish, but all would come to repentance. And each of us plays a role in to that end in various roles, because we have different giftings, different anointings God pours out onto us. But if we will allow him, he'll take those giftings that he's poured into us and again, make a pipeline. He's creating a delivery channel. What is that delivery channel for? It's a word of testimony. It's an act of kindness. It's a meal to somebody who's hungry. It's shelter. I told you guys, we, you know, I spent 10 years with a family homeless shelter, long-term family homeless shelter as the pastor. We were doing uh, two Bible studies and a preaching service seven days a week. On Sunday, we did two preaching services. So there was a lot of word going on. And, and the reason that that shelter was successful and half of those people left with jobs and homes was because the word was getting into them. Not because we did anything really cool except give them a place to stay and food to eat. The word got into them. And we didn't have rules. We had a covenant. Okay, you come here, we'll do this, this, and this for you. And you agree to do this, this, and this. And, and we'd have, we had a kind of a three strikes thing. That was probably the only rule we had. But <clears throat> if you want to live on the streets, you can go live on the streets. That's your choice. What we said in the covenant was you can choose to be here in the presence of the, of the spirit of God with food and shelter or, and, and you can and you can live in this covenant, or you can go out on the streets and get what's out there. And occasionally, people chose the streets because they wanted what was out there. At least they thought they did. <clears throat> so I want to take you now to this. Um, I, I I I have preached this message going right down to the bottom here. Your thoughts become your choices expressed as your words and actions, which become your habits, which become your character, which ultimately becomes your destiny. And, and you can see the, the fruit of the spirit listed out there, Galatians 5, 22 through 26. And, and, and over the last couple of weeks, one of the things we've been talking about is meekness and humility. Meekness and humility. If, if we're going to walk into the fullness of what God has for us, those need to become character traits of ours, which means we have to train our thoughts and train our actions so that they reflect meekness and humility. I'm going fast through these slides because I'm hungry. Okay, just so you don't. Um, I want to look at this because we're back down to the we're back in the we're back in the submarine here for just a second. Um, I, I want to read this from uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse uh, 32 through 39. And therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him also I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace. What? You're the Prince of Peace. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than these is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. There is so much more depth to that than our eternal salvation. There is so much more depth to that. Because the enemy comes with an arsenal that God's already defeated, but we have to utilize that arsenal if we're going to be successful in the walk that he's called us to. All right, so up periscope. So if destroy is out of the equation, then the enemy will be full on steal and kill. And, and here's the steal and kill mode. He attacks your thoughts so that he can alter your choices, which then are expressed by the way, he's attacking you through your words and your actions to erode your habits, which become your character, which ultimately becomes your destiny less than the Lord had in mind. You hear what I'm saying? We have to be active and engaged in our walk 
or the enemy who can no longer destroy us will steal and kill every aspect of good that may be coming our way. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> if you know there's a, an armed burglar in, in, the, in the town right where you are, and you leave your door unlocked, what do you think might happen? Do you think the chances are greater the armed burglar is going to come in your house or is he going to go to one where the door's locked? All right, we need to be able to start locking the door in our thoughts and in our words and in our choices. Otherwise, the enemy is going to come in. All right, now, I, want to, I want to read this last scripture down here that I have on this. <clears throat> this is from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 13. This is, we're, this is a day-to-day -day battle. And in this day-to-day -day battle can be really intense when we're walking out what God has entrusted to us in our lives. But there is a day of, there's a rest, okay? There remains, this is from Hebrews chapter 4, the beginning in the ninth verse. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Now, I'm using a lot of New King James today, but I, I will use different types. I'll use the Amplified. I'll use, I, I want to look and see what's expressing because, I, I'm going after the actual meaning, but I also want to look at how how the context reads. So this this is there therefore remain there remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his work works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall to the same example of disobedience. So what's he saying? We are not able by our own flesh and blood to put these attacks off that are going to be coming at our thoughts or coming out of our mouth or being expressed in our actions. We can't control that by, by, by our own flesh because our flesh is, is going to tend to operate in a different way than the spirit. <clears throat> so it says the word of, for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword piercing, even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him <clears throat> to whom we must give account. There is a lot to unpack in that, but one of the things that you have to unpack is this is not about a list of rules and regulations. What this is about is an intimacy if we're going to succeed in this walk that he has for us, we have to enter his rest. We need to rest in the fact that he has already won the victory that is going at that the enemy who's trying to steal and kill because he can't destroy us anymore. That battle, the steal and kill battle is also already won, but we have to stand our ground. The word says stand and having done all to stand, remain standing. And we, and we need to remain standing, not in our armor, not, not in our toughness, but in the whole armor of God. All right, next slide. Okay, so this is a little by little. Steal, kill, and destroy. Little by little, steal, kill, and destroy takes its toll. There are things we tolerate, we will allow and tolerate in our lives that are contrary to God's plan for our best. Little by little. Okay, so... We talked about this a little bit last week. Um, you, you remember uh, Aaron was engaged in a little bit of gossip about Moses marrying this girl from another town, essentially. And God, God overheard the gossip and he said, hear now my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision and I will speak to him in a dream. I'm not going to rely on your gossip to tell me what's going on. But it is not, that's not in the Bible. I just put that there. But it is not so with my servant Moses. He is entrusted and faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth directly, clearly and openly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? We got to watch the stuff that gets in and takes out the foundational stuff that God's put in place. When we allow gossip and talebearing and judgmentalism, I'm not going to read this whole thing right here. The next one, you can look it up. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 2, 2. God tells us not to be judging and not to criticize. That's not our role. What's our role? We're supposed to, what, what does it say in Micah chapter 6? I think it's in the 8th verse, 6 through 8. What does the Lord require of you, O man, but to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God? Not gossip, not judge. That's not anywhere in there. We have to watch those little things. All right. 
by humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. This is, uh, we were talking about meekness last week. And it's just so important to remember. Um, Matthew chapter 26, verses 53 and 54. Jesus says, do you think I cannot appeal to my father and he will immediately provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then will the scripture be fulfilled that it must happen this way? I was, I was going to, this morning, I was going to add El Shaddai. It was one of the songs I wanted to do, but I couldn't get it all downloaded in time. But um, the challenge was, the word was very clear that the time of Jesus was coming very close. But as clear as the scripture was, the people couldn't discern, most of them, that Jesus was the Messiah. And, and it, became, it became clear, but he had to walk this out. And we, and we talked about last week, remember, we, we talked about meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. Jesus could have had his fight. He knew what he was getting ready to see. He knew he was getting ready to be flailed. He knew he was getting ready to be nailed to the cross. And he knew he was getting ready to die. He, he, I, up, there was another scripture I was reading a little bit earlier. Uh, last week, but it's the one where he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from my hands. But what does he say then? Not my will, but your will. You see, we have those same moments day to day in our lives. We have those same moments where we can react according to what the Word of God has taught us how to react, or we can choose to react in the way the world reacts. Hebrews 12 Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated at the place of honor besides God's, beside God's throne. Probably going to have to read all of these, but I want to see which one it's okay i i gotta say this and and for me it's an everyday thing multiple times through the day because i'm just overwhelmed with god's goodness we have to be taking time out of our day whatever the busyness is that we're going through or whatever blessings we're enjoying we got to take time and thank god you know <laughs> there's so much power in thanks i don't i think we miss the point uh, because we just we see Jesus just multiplying loaves and fishes, okay? But what does he do when he's got those five those five loaves and those two fish? The first thing he does, Father, thank you. <laughs> Father, thank you. So often we miss an opportunity to bring joy to our Heavenly Father, to bring joy to the Holy Spirit, to bring joy to Jesus by just something really, something really clicked that could have been bad. I, I remember I was I was coming back from I was coming back from San Antonio. Okay, so I was coming back from San Antonio, and I hadn't noticed that my front end alignment had taken my tires down to next to nothing. And so, like I'm I'm like all of a sudden getting a warning on my dashboard. You know, you're about to lose tires here. So I I I get off immediately, um, and it's like almost the end of the day, and I call. The tire company, they said, oh, man, if you can't get it here, you're stuck. And call another. They go, oh, we can't help you. And I prayed. I said, okay, Lord, thank you. You got something going on here. The tire company calls me back. Hey, we got a tow truck who can come over and get you. And, and he'll get you over here in time to get those tires on so you can get on down the road. I want, I want to tell you there's so much power in Thanksgiving. I, I remember at the shelter when the time we had like about 100 staying there, we ran out of food. We didn't, And we were feeding 100 people three meals a day. Kids were going, taking lunches to school. And we prayed and we gave thanks to God for all he'd done. And the next day, by the end of the day, not only did we have enough food for the next month, 
which is about 9,000 meals, by the way, for the next month. But we also had a walk-in cooler and freezer that we didn't have before we started that day. And we didn't call out to anybody for help. We didn't call the Episcopal Church down the street because they were the richest church in town. We didn't, we, we didn't go over and call the newspapers. We just prayed and gave thanks to God, and he provided. And, and then in, in, in 2020, in January, I get diagnosed with stage 3 colon cancer. And I walk out of Texas Oncology directly to the Rio Grande River and shout, Hallelujah! Because he said so. He told me I already had won the battle, but I had to walk through it, knowing that it was already won. That's how we walk through life. I was professing my, my, my healing. I knew I received not only eternal life, but abundant life, which included my health. When, when Jesus Christ took those stripes, I read it in the word with his stripes, I'm healed. I received it. I walked in it, and God blessed me because of it. And then in April of 2021, the oncologist says, no, he doesn't say you're in remission. He says, you have no cancer in your body, period. All right. That's the God we serve. Jesus said, you can say to that mountain, be lifted up and cast into the sea and it'll be done. But we've got to work on the deeper issues. And those deeper issues are based on our character. And if our character does not reflect the character of Christ, how can we expect ourselves to speak to a mountain and toss it into the sea? You know, some of the things that we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis, they're, they're like basic blocking and tackling. But every year when football practice started, no matter how many years you've been in football practice, you ran up and down the field, you did push-ups, you practice blocking, you practice practice tackling, you practice holding the ball. It's not a whole lot different in our walk with Christ. In James chapter 4, it starts out, therefore submit to God, verse 7. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. I, some of you heard the story, some of you haven't. In the, in the, in the 80s, early 80s, I was, I was a VP of engineering for a company in Houston, and I was using an ounce of cocaine a week by myself and, and, and hanging out at, at the recording studios where there was lots of stuff going on. And, and God, one day I was on, on the way home, um, and, and I had about an eighth of an ounce in my pocket of Coke. And, uh, and I was so overburdened and I've, I've got a wife and kids at home and I'm living this double life. And I said, uh, Lord, if I have to live like this one more day, I'd rather die. He said, give me your addiction. I paid the price for it. I said, okay, that works. He said, if you believe me, take what you have in your pocket, strip it out in the, in the garbage can and go on home. And I heard this first line, this first verse as I was heading out. I didn't even know it was in the scripture until I got I looked it up, probably heard it when I was a kid. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. I got home <clears throat> and I was kicking myself in the butt because I didn't, I threw that cocaine away because it cost money. Money was everything, you know, you know how that is. And I was getting ready to pick up the phone and, and call the drug dealer who would bring me and give it to me on credit if I wanted. And the Lord said, now, and I said, okay, Lord, I submit to you. I resist you. Satan, you got to flee. I had a rough night, but then I had six weeks and I didn't even think about cocaine. That's how deliberate I was. And I was in deep. Then it says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Sometimes when we feel distant from God, that's the time when we realize it in the moment. Take a step toward him. Let, his, let your faith and love reach out to him and watch what he does. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. So often, just as I was, Christians are some of the best double agents there are. They got that get-out-of-hell-free card. And they do all the religious stuff. But then... What's the fruit coming from the character? 
I'm not a judge. But what it does is it calls me closer to him. And, and when you're in a fog and what didn't make sense all of a sudden, what did make sense doesn't make sense anymore. And you don't know what to do. The eight most powerful words in the Bible were the ones Saul of Tarsus uttered when he realized he was talking to the risen Messiah. Lord, what do you want me to do? And he will faithfully walk you through. I want to tell you, as we yield these bits and pieces of our flesh to him that we hold on to, whatever it is. I mean, it, sin is sin. And, 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 and you guys read the Ten Commandments and Levitical laws and maybe even some of the rabbinical edicts. Who knows? But the point is, God's looking at our heart. What does the Lord require of you? Do what's right. Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. We need, as a church, to come out of this religious pride thing. Because religious pride, honestly, not a whole lot different than the other kind of pride. It's just pride. Jesus said, the greatest among you will be the servant of all. Proverbs says, when pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. How can we possibly get through all this? You have to be born again, but listen, I got to tell you a little bit deeper. You also have to be completely surrendered to him. And, and this was an event, like this is the story where Paul and Silas are in, in jail and at night. I'm telling you, Thanksgiving and praise are amazing. They're in jail. And they're, they're chained. And what we want to do, I don't know. Oh, let's just praise God. And what happens? The chains fall off. The doors get flung open. But more than that, as that happened, an opportunity to share the gospel was birthed. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved and your house. Wow. And understanding this as believers, we go through difficult things. This is from the Amplified Romans 8.28. We know with great confidence that God, our Father, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his plan, purpose. So the bottom line is, who is Jesus to you? We shared this a little bit last week, but it, it just, it bears repeating. And I, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm a, I'm a fan of the chosen. I love watching this when it was played out. And, and, uh, I, and I know that theater is theater and Bible's Bible. And I love the way they woven the Bible into the theater. And, uh, and I think pretty much they're truthful about it. And I, I was watching the scene where Jesus is with his disciples and, and they're near, a, they're near, place where idol worship is being carried out and and jesus steps out from among them and says who do people say that i am and said so, some say elijah some say john the baptist you know a lot of people say jesus is savior but who do you say jesus is is he your lord is he your savior is he a t-shirt for you. Who is Jesus to you? You know, there was, there's a need in each of us that only God can fill. And uh, I was hoping I'd get to a slide that I really like. I don't think I got to it yet. I will say this. Um, believe that Jesus Christ died for you and rose again as many as received him to him. To them gave he power to become sons of God even to them that believe on his name. I, I, I want to remind you that salvation is to be made whole in every way. It's not just that bridge to heaven at the end of this life. It's, it's making you whole in every way so that you can be fruitful in the calling that God has on your life. How do you get there? Commit your way to the Lord and you'll bring it to pass. I'm going to click down. There's that slide. I, I, obviously, I didn't take this picture, because, but it's cool. I've seen it happen so many times in my life. I didn't see how there was a way. And then I looked to Jesus. 
I didn't see my way out of problems. And then I looked to Jesus. And just as the parting of the Red Sea happened in reality so many times in our life, if we'll look to the hope that is Jesus, he will part those waves and he'll lead us right into his perfect will. But you know what it requires? That we trust and obey. It requires that when we hear the Holy Spirit speak to our heart and convince us of sin in an area, that becomes a part of our past. We repent. That means we turn our back on it. It's behind us. And then we go forward into what God has for us. And we allow him through our thoughts and our words and our choices to build our character such that he can use us in this day. I want to pray with you right now as we prepare to wrap this up. And before we finish, the service will come up and have uh, communion together before we go down and have dinner, lunch. I'll tell you, I, I still think back to that day and, and I, I don't think I was trying, I know I wasn't trying to impress my parents and I uh, really didn't care what everybody else thought, but I was 12 years old and I was in Phoenix, Arizona and I was at a Billy Graham crusade because my mom took me there. And then I heard, just as I am. And I was up out of that bleacher and I was going down to the front. And I know I received Jesus. I, I know that the destroy option was out for the devil from that point on. But I chose to live like hell a lot of different times in my life. Then he grabbed me when I was in my 30s. And he said, uh, I have better plans for you than this. It's right after, I, right after I had been delivered of cocaine, he got me involved in this little independent fundamental white shirt, skinny black tie, short hair Baptist church. Uh, I've been in so many different denominations. I mean, I'm 20 plus years as a Catholic and Church of England and Presbyterian. A lot of times, whatever was closest is where my dad took us. And you got Church of England on one side of your family, Roman Catholic on the other. You just, dad just took us everywhere. But it was relationship that drew me in. And that's what. God wants to have happen today for everybody that hears this, not only a new born again, new creation relationship, but a deeper walk and understanding the purpose for your life. The destiny and purpose that God has in store for you is to bless you and make you a blessing for an objective that he has that not any would perish, but all would come to repentance. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and, and Lord, I, I just hearken back to that time when I was 12. And I pray, Lord, <clears throat> in this room around the world, wherever this message reaches, I know we don't hit hundreds even, but Lord, one, you're after one, you're after two, you're after as many. Lord, you've put a number on, on my heart that I'm believing you for. And Lord, I'll, I'll hear about this, I believe, before I come home to be with you forever. And I, I want that place full because I know that's what you want. And so if you're listening to this right now and you've never, never asked Jesus to come into your life, maybe you've, you realize that there's some stuff going on in your life lying, cheating, stealing, fornication, whatever. There's stuff going on in your life. You know it's not supposed to be. You know you've felt bad about it, and, and now it's time to get right with the God who is extending to you eternal life, and, and, and not just that, but life more abundantly, wholeness, healing. Just with me right now, Lord Jesus, I, I come to you right now. I, I'm sorry for my sin. I repent, turn my back on it. I know I should have been doing it anyway. I'm sorry. Come into my life and save me. I, I receive your, your sacrifice, your shed blood. 
as a full payment for my sins. Help me to walk this out. And if if you're listening to this and you're you're all, you've already made that decision and you're like me and you've you've had some Frank Sinatra moments in your life where you did it your way. Maybe you still are. Here's that opportunity to lay that before the Lord and say, I repent. He loves it when we do that. I repent. I'm sorry. Take me into a deeper or meaningful walk with you. And I serve a God of miracles. And if you're trusting God for a miracle, maybe it's a healing, maybe it's a relationship, maybe whatever it is, business, finances. Just want to pray right now for Pastor Vincent and Brother Stephen also, Lord, walking church and for Sister Thondra. Father, you see these, all who need miracles. Lord, you know what I'm trusting you for. You know what I'm believing you for. Lord, every one of us have needs. We also have desires of our heart. And we lift those up to you right now. And we ask, Lord, in the course of blessing us, we receive the blessing. Just, just say to the Lord right now, I receive it. Whatever the answer prayer is that you need right now, I receive it, Lord. Lord, we thank you that as we receive this blessing, you are broadening the channel of blessing from you to a lost world, to a hurting world, to a dying world. Lord, I, I just thank you right now. I got a word on liver. Somebody's got a liver issue. That liver is healed right now in Jesus' name. And a cervical spine problem, a disc that was shattered, it's being healed. <clears throat> Okay, a young woman, young, I got teenager, late teenager, 20s. God has a calling on your life. Just ask him what he wants you to do. I know you're hearing it right now. Just ask him what he wants you to do. Father, I thank you. Okay. I don't know if it's a head injury or a tumor. It's in the right side in the back. God's healing that right now. In Jesus name. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here, to be in your presence, to receive your amazing love. Help us to be dispensers of that amazing love. Wherever we go, in Jesus' name, amen.